I want to welcome those that are watching us online to the First Christian Church of Boone. We're here in beautiful Boone, North Carolina. If you ever out here, come and stop and see us. We'd love to see you from you. Thank my God through Jesus Christ for each and every one of you being here today. And God, whom I love and serve, it brings you such joy to once again share the good news about his son, Jesus Christ. Now, before we start, I'd like to apologize if it's too hot, too cold. And I've noticed that um, the people on this side of the church are always cold. And the people on this side of the church are always hot. So this is telling me we've got cold Christians and hot Christians, but praise God we have no lukewarm Christians here. Amen? <clears throat> you know, don't think about this, right? Isn't social media wonderful? I mean, let's face it. You can stay in touch with your family and your friends, people you haven't seen in a long time. You can watch videos of your nieces and nephews on their first steps and your grandchildren. You can share even your grandmother's recipe. You can even make personal contact with your best friends from high school um, on their birthday. You, see, you can see your friends or what they're up to and what kind of fun and fascinating things they're doing in their lives. Or even monitor your classmates' um, battle with cancer. Even though you're separated by distance, you can carry all your friends and your family um, right there with you on your phone. Stick it in your pocket, your purse. Or Wherever, but it's not the same as being there in person, is it? I mean, it's there's no substitute for holding your mother's hand when she gets maybe some bad news, or sitting next to your father watching the sports or just talking. A relationship is more than following the news feeds or just, you know, reading about it. It's being an eyewitness to history and experiencing it. Let me ask you this. What kind of relationship do you have with Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Or do you just know about Jesus? That may sound like an odd question. However, most people know a lot of facts about Jesus and his life and which are told from their parents or, or their preachers or in church. Um, they, hold on one moment. And you might sit there and think to yourself, what's the difference? You know, I, I know all these facts about Jesus. I know Jesus, right? Yeah. Consider this, in Nazareth, when Jesus, the people there knew Jesus' uh, parents, who they were, and they knew him as a child. Um, they heard reports that of his preaching around the world, around the area, and, and uh, they heard about his miracles, and they were thrilled to have him come for a visit. But they didn't know Jesus as well as they thought they did. See, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And when Jesus started to tell them uh, what they needed to do and what they needed to change, well, what happened? The people got upset. They wanted to kill him. Just knowing the facts about Jesus doesn't change our behavior or attitude. Let's face it. Knowing something objectively and knowing it subjectively are two completely different things. Look at it this way. Adoring fans of, of movies and TV, music, and sports, um, those stars, they spend, they, they will spend a lot of money and sometimes get all this new information and photos and all these little tidbits about their favorite stars. And after looking at hours of information, they feel as though, hey, I really know this person. This is my hero. But do they? You know, you may know certain facts about your chosen hero. You may be able to cite their birthday, how many children they have, their favorite color, or even their childhood pets. But if you were to meet that person face to face, what would they say? 
Does the fan really know the hero? Just following the story about Jesus won't make you feel ashamed or of your sins or lead you to trust in him as your Lord and Savior just because you know the facts. You, and it is certainly won't get you into heaven. You know why? Because knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. <coughs> Away from me, you evildoers. There were people in Jesus' day who thought they knew who Jesus was. They thought they were his friend because they knew the law. Uh, they made um, strict rules for themselves and for others. And they listened to his teaching. They followed him, applauded his miracles, and liked some of what he said. I know it says that some because... You know, he didn't always say things that the people liked. He didn't really tell us what we want to hear. He told us what we need to hear. But Jesus calls them evil doers and states, I never knew you. Knowing Jesus, it means taking to heart what he says about our sin. Knowing Jesus means that there's nothing you can do to make this relationship work, but that he makes it all possible. Knowing Jesus means experiencing his love and his forgiveness. Knowing Jesus means walking with him through the darkest days of your life. Knowing Jesus, that means a relationship that never, never ends, no matter how bad things get or Wherever, whatever bad news you may receive, whatever it is. Today, there are thousands, if not millions of people who know all about Jesus. That is, they, can, they know, some, or know some facts about him, but they might even be able to commit some Bible verses from memory from now and then. Perhaps they even attend church, but they have never allowed the facts to become their personal reality. Well, Jesus explains the problem. They hold knowledge in their heads without allowing the truth to penetrate their hearts. Think about that. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. It can be easy to substitute religion for real relationship with, her, with Jesus. Oh, I go to church every Sunday. I, 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 I read the Bible once in a while. I know a few scriptures. We often think if we're doing Christian things that that all counts. We can appreciate the facts of Jesus' death and resurrection, but until we have made him our Lord, the facts do us no good. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved and scripture says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame for there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles and the same Lord is Lord of all and richly bless all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. There's a difference, a big difference between intellectual assent 
and saving faith. Knowing Jesus means we have accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the God, the righteousness of God. We ask him to be the Lord of all, all of our lives. We identify with him and his death and we consider our old selves to have died with him. We accept his forgiveness and cleansing from sin and seek to know him. And in an intimate fellowship through the Holy Spirit, when we repent of our sins and surrender our lives to him, Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to our life, comes to lie, live inside us, each and every one of us, and it changes us forever. The fact we know about Jesus come, comes alive as we get to know him personally. Let's say you you read a, 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 a that your favorite star has green eyes and a dimple on her chin. And those traits are, are merely facts on paper, right? Um, they, until you meet them face to face, then suddenly those green eyes are looking at you, and that dimple's uh, looking at it, and her chin is looking at you, and she when she smiles, she tells you all about her day and her fears and her inner thoughts. You may recall that you heard some of those facts before, but now those facts you you've now experienced them. They are now real. You knew about her before. But now, you know her a little better. The abstract has become concrete. Things you thought you knew start to make sense. And as you enter into a relationship, the same things start to happen. Try this. When you read the eyewitness accounts um, that are written in the Bible about Jesus and what he did, put yourself in their place and apply what you they saw and heard to your own life. It's a little bit different way of looking things. Stay in touch with your Savior by regularly reading and listening to God's Word. And you need to speak to Him in prayer. This is very, very important. Join together with other Christians to grow in the, your knowledge about Jesus and, and what He means for you and what He means for them. You know, it's so easy for us to want to talk about ourselves, right? Me, 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 me. It's only me, me. No. Try asking somebody about their testimony. Just want to say, hey, um, you know, Billy, what's your testimony? I better tell you. See, then you get to know that person better. Same thing when you work with Jesus. You know, the statement is so true. No Jesus. No peace. No Jesus. No peace. Jesus is a person. To know him is to enter into a relationship. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. It's hard to love someone you don't know. If you don't know anything, it's hard to love them. Loving him starts with surrendering to his plan for your life. That's what it means to make him Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. With him, there, he is always there with you. Nothing can ever shake you. Nothing can sway you. And you keep your eyes always on the Lord with him at the right hand. You will not be shaken. The nature of God is so vast and complex that no human being on this planet can ever fully know and understand everything there is to know about him. But 
Life is about continually seeking God, learning more about Him, and enjoying His fellowship. It is also important to spend time with the Lord, spending alone time with God, that is. All relationships take time. A relationship with God, while unlike other relationships in many ways, still follows the rules of other relationships that we have. The Bible is filled with comparisons to help us to uh, conceptualize our relationship with God. Let's go for an example. All right. Christ is the, depicted as the bridegroom, and we are the bride, the church, that is. Marriage is two, two joining of their lives as one. Such intimacy involves time spent alone with each other, talking to each other. Communication is extremely important. Another relationship is that of a father and a child. Close parent relationships are those in which children and parents have that special alone time together. I know that my granddaughter's fun when we're all together, but I really like that time when, when nobody else is there and I'm old. I'm sure my wife feels the same way. And you felt the same way about your children. That time alone with them is just so precious. Spending time alone with a loved one provides an opportunity to truly come to know that person. Spending time alone with God is no different. When we're alone with God, we draw close to Him and get to know Him in a, a different way than, than we're, we do when we just read and hear stories. God desires a long time with each and every one of us. He wants a personal relationship with us. He created us as individuals, knitting us in the womb. God knows the intimate details of our lives. He even knows the number of hairs that are on your head. He knows the, the sparrows individually. And you are worth far more than sparrows. He invited us to come to Him and know Him. When we desire to know God intimately, we will seek Him earnestly. And we will spend time with Him daily. We will be like Mary, sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to His voice. The disciples, when they were sitting there, listening to Him teach them. The, the mass amount of people that were sitting there when he, he was teaching the, the Sermon on the Mount and feeding the people. We will be just like that. We will hunger and thirst for righteousness and we will be filled. Perhaps the best reason for us to spend time alone with God is to follow biblical examples. In the Old Testament, um, we see God called prophets to to spend time alone with him. Moses met with him alone on, on the mountain when he gave him the, uh, the when he spoke to him in the fire and bush and gave him the, the commandments. David has many songs reflecting a, and a confident familiarity with God. He even communes with him while that he was on the run from Saul and trying to kill him. He was still in a relationship with God. God presented him uh, presence passed by as Elijah was in a cave. In the New Testament, Jesus spent a long time with God a lot. I, I, I'm not going to give you all the examples on the screen, but if, if you need some, Matthew 4, uh, 14, 13, Mark 1, 35, Mark 6, 45, 46, Mark 14, 32 through 34, Luke 4.42, Luke 5.16, Luke 6.12, Luke 9.18, John 6.15. It goes on. Okay? You see, he spends a lot of time talking to God, right? Jesus actually instructed us to pray to God alone at times. 
When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. To, to rely on Jesus as, your, as our vine, as in John 15, we will need to be directly and intimately connected to Him. Not just hearing. Just as the branch is linked directly to the vines and through the vine connects to the other branches, so we are linked directly to Christ and therefore share in a community. We spend time alone with God and in worship for the best nourishment that we can possibly have. Without time alone with God, we'll find our needs are unmet. We will not truly know the abundant life that he wants to give each and every one of us if we don't spend time with him. I guess what I'm trying to say is spending time alone with God rids our minds of distractions so that we can now focus on him and hear his word, abiding in him. We enjoy the intimacy in which he calls us and comes to truly know him. We are so blessed. We are blessed because of the love of Christ. The love of Christ is the, is, is the opposed to the love for Christ. It refers to the love that he has towards us, toward mankind. His love can be briefly stated as his uh, as his willingness to act on our best interest, especially in meeting that, that greatest need, even though it cost him his life and everything, and even though we were the least worthy of such love, Christ loved each and every one of us. Through Christ being God of nature, exists from the beginning of time and with God the Father and the Holy Spirit he willingly left his throne came down to heaven became a man and he might he paid that not might he paid the penalty for our sins so that we would not have to pay it he took those beings. He was nailed to that cross for us. Why? Because mankind's sin had, has been paid by his actions of the cross. God took a sinless man who died for all the sins of the world. He became our Lord and Savior. God who is just and holy can now forgive our sins when we accept Jesus Christ as payment for our own. Thus, Christ's love is shown in his leaving his home in heaven. When he was worshipped, honored, as he is well deserved, to come to earth and to be a man, to have to deal with the problems of this planet, he would be mocked, betrayed, beaten, and crucified on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Rise again from the dead on the third day. He considered our need of a Savior was so important. We needed to be saved from our sin. And it's the penalty as more important than his own comfort and life. It wasn't easy for him to do that. Because he knew ahead of time what was going to happen. Sometimes people may give their lives willingly for one another, someone they deem worthy, a friend, a relative, a child, other good people. But Christ's love, <laughs> that goes way beyond all that. Christ's love extends to those most unworthy of it. He willingly took the punishment for those who tortured him, hated him, 
and cared nothing about him. They followed him. Oh, no, we're going to turn. They turned their backs on him. He still, he took his life, gave his life for them. Those who were most undeserving of his love. He gave the most he could give for those who deserve the least. Amen. His sacrifice is the essence of godliness. It's the essence of godly love, which is called the agape love. This is godlike love, not manlike love. This love, which he demonstrated toward us on the cross, is just the beginning. When we place our trust in Him as our Lord, as our Savior, He makes God, He makes us all God's children. We are now co-heirs with Him. Amen. He comes to dwell with us through the Holy Spirit, promising that His will never will leave us. He will never forsake us. He will always be there. He'll give us strength. He'll guide us. Thus, we have a loving compassion for life because of Jesus Christ. No matter what you're going through, He is there. No matter what comes your way, He is there. And His love is ever available to us. But as he rightly reigns as the benevolent king in heaven. We need to give him the position he deserves in our lives as well. We need to honor him. We need to share our lives with him. Yes, he knows everything that's happening. He knows everything. But he wants to hear it from you. That conversation we need to give him everything that he deserves. That he is the master of our lives and not merely just a companion. It is only then that we will experience life as he intended and our lives will be have that fulfillment of his love. Spending time with the Lord on a daily basis will change your life. It'll change everything. You will suddenly find joy that fills your heart, peace that is there like a river. You know where this is going. And love that flows out of you like a fountain. All heard that song, right? And the church said, Amen. Wow, we got through that a little quicker than I expected really quick <laughs> today. I'm so thrilled. We're going to do our invitation. For those that are online, and you know, if, if you're ready to become a Christian by receiving Christ as your Savior, all you have to do is believe. Do you understand and believe that you have sinned and are worthy of judgment from God? Do you understand and believe that Jesus took the, your punishment upon himself, dying in your place on the cross? Do you understand and believe that his death was the sufficient sacrifice to pay for your sins? Well, then it's time to turn your life to Jesus. All you have to do is accept him, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and Savior. He died on that cross and he rose on the third day. And start your relationship with Jesus.